All right, let's go. Hello, everyone who decided to watch this video. So, sound all right, I hope so. All right, <clears throat> so it's been about three weeks since my last upload. And I got home about one week ago from my 10 day Vipassana trip. And I've taken the time to process everything that's been going on and spend time with my boys, with my family. And it's, it's kind of weird to sit right here and be back. But I've been kind of fearing making this video, but also been very excited and I knew I had to make it. I knew I had to tell you guys about my trip and what's been going on. And it, it's some heavy stuff. Uh, that's some, some very, some very, um, interesting things happened. And I think Interesting things are bound to happen when you do nothing but meditate for 10 days straight in absolute silence, 11 hours of meditation every day. Um, so after the, after the 10 days and then going back to reality, it was quite a, a big shock, like, um, I had to get used to the feeling of being around people, everyday life. But now I feel more at ease. And also I, I, I caught some sort of uh, virus when I got back, of course. All right, let's get into it. So the drive up there took me eight and a half hours. Normally it, it would take six and a half hours, but there was a lot of snow, um, but somehow I made it up there and I met and I checked in, I suppose. So basically, when you arrive, uh, there's a few helpers, or like teachers, assistant teachers, I guess the, those are called. Uh, they help you get checked in. They ask you a few questions, like who you are and, and your name and just to check if every, if if everything is okay and then you deliver your uh, phone your keys uh your wallet and uh you sort of get to talk to the other people because there are 50 men and there are 50 women and we uh would live in uh, like separated camps so we wouldn't have so so we couldn't like make contact with the women or be distracted by the feminine energy uh so i saw many of the women because we had some sort of introductory uh, evening before the first day where we would enter what we, what is called a noble silence. 
uh yeah so we got checked in and everything was normal it, it was some very nice cabins in the wood and you could sort of see no actually i i didn't know where we were where we were going to meditate so i just saw all these cabins where we could where we were going to stay and and eat but again two different camps so the only time we, we would see the women was in the meditation hall where all the 130 people would stay for all the meditations all right so we are told where we uh, where we um, are going to stay where, where we're going to sleep and I'm given my place, which is a, a annex, an annex, which housed uh, eight people, eight men, and in two rooms. So I had three roommates in my room, and it was just four beds and a like a place to store clothes. And then all of us eight guys, we had to share one bathroom with one bath and one toilet. Uh, and in the bathroom, there was no mirror. And also, we had no clock. Um, so, the first night before starting the actual course, uh, we were told to talk about how we were going to move around, how we were going to uh, interact without interacting, because we are told not to have eye contact, not to look at each other, just be as if you were there by yourself doing the hard work. So we would just move around and just sleep and eat and then go meditate. That was the mission. That was what we were going to do. And so we did. Um, so, so I talked to the guys, really nice guys. There was like... There were people from all ages, like 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, maybe even 70s. In the 60s, 70s, it, it's it's hard to tell, you know. And it was people from business backgrounds, uh, teachers, all sorts of backgrounds. And many of them, I found out later, had no background in meditation, had no some sort of experience. They want, just wanted to try it out. So everyone was welcome to try Vipassana. So we meditated. Um, I think we meditated a little bit in the evening. Yes, we had some sort of introduction. And then for the next 10 days, we would rise at four in the morning and we would go to bed between nine and ten at night. And it was actually very easy to rise that early at four in the morning. And uh, from 4.30 to 6.30, we had a two-hour meditation and then we would have breakfast. And after breakfast, there would be a, a short break and then we would meditate. Uh, again and then we would meditate again and then we would have uh, lunch and lunch was our last meal of the day so we didn't have any dinner and all the food was uh, vegetarian really nice food but my stomach and my digestion has not really dealt with uh, vegetarian food in a long time so I had a lot of bloating, a lot of gas, and <laughs> all of that. But it wasn't really important because we didn't eat that much. And we only had dinner and breakfast. Sorry, we only had breakfast and lunch and not dinner. Yes. All right. Um, the first three days... We were learning the technique of anapana, which is basically focusing on your breath. But we also had some extra focus points 
uh, which we were supposed to focus on really intently. And let me tell you, when you focus on one point for 11 hours a day in the 18 hours that you are awake, you get really focused. And there was nothing else. There was, there was only the meditation technique that you could sort of like work on, delve into, do something about. Uh, there was no escaping. We couldn't escape the feelings or the work. Well, you could, but we had all like we all met up. We all we all went there to do the work, right? So why? So why go back? Like I, I was determined to 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 see it through, finish the ten days, learn the technique, do the work, and reap the benefits. But there were so many times through those three days where I just felt like, what the fuck am I doing here? This is so, so difficult. This is so hard. And not like the the technique isn't difficult, Anapana. It's just focusing on your breath. But that's exactly what happens. It's so many hours and you're so focused and your mind is constantly trying to come up with different um, ideas as to why you should leave early or why you shouldn't be doing the work right now. Constant procrastination ideas coming up or how you could manage to like not be 100% focused. And that was really interesting to sort of observe my mind constantly trying to... um, what do you call it? Like ruin the experience. It it didn't want to work. <laughs> uh yeah, it's a word for it, but I can't find out find it right now. Um so yeah. For three days it was really, really tough. But I kept going and I was so de- so determined because I didn't want to leave empty-handed. I didn't want to leave with the story of, yeah, I was there for three days, and then I gave up. And now I'm just back to square one. Yoo-hoo! So no, but, okay, so the three days went by, and then I didn't know that day four, we was going to be given the Vipassana technique. And I am not, really supposed to or allowed to teach the technique because I will butcher it and I will yeah it's it's really important that I don't teach the technique but I can basically say that it's about so so vipassana means seeing things as they are so you see reality as it is, but not on a intellectual level, on an experiential level. So you experience the truth of what everything is in your body through your senses, because that is what we were taught, that everything starts with the senses, and then the senses react. And the reaction, the habit of reaction to certain sense sense stimuli is called, they call it sankaras. So sankaras is the reaction from your body to input through through the senses. And only after your reaction is done does it go to the intellectual level and you can reflect on what you did. And this was mind-blowing, not just to hear, but, but to experience it and to observe how my body reacted. So throughout the many, many, many hours, all of the sudden we were ready to receive the Vipassana technique. And that was basically just being more focused on the entire body, but, but step by step by step we were taught 
how to focus on the body and like feel the body or on a real level not some made up shit because I think you know that your mind can make up a lot of stuff and try to tell you that this is the real reality but it isn't so we were constantly being focused and not allowing thoughts to take us away but going back to feeling like um, feeling all kinds of sensations on the body like tickling or warmth or cold heat or cold or like um, expansion or pressure or expansion right here or uh, uh, very very nice feelings um, in the leg or burning sensations or pain and when you do it for so many hours so throughout the days day three day four day five day six I, I thought from day one, wow, I really got this technique round. Now, I really figured it out. But every day, it was just, it, it, it was just go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper for every day throughout all 10 days. And it got to the point where I could just flip a switch and just feel my entire body on a very, very deep level, like muscular, small, f- fibers of and like at one point i'd feel like I, I could feel like the strings of some of my muscle or like some of the nerve endings or like signaling through my leg where i had this old injury so i i could like feel the signaling going on it was insane there was three sessions every day where we had to do one hour of something called aditana meditation where you're supposed to sit in in complete stillness and not move at all not open your eyes not move your hands no changing positions and these three sessions which were one hour each they really did some deep work because what happens when you sit completely still Then you get to realize how much your mind is fighting. How much it wants you to feel something. How much it wants to feel pleasure. uh, pleasure, How much it wants to avoid pain. And you know, it's easy to think, oh yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. it's, It's so important to experience it. To feel it, what's going on. So you're kind of flipping the script from how do I feel? And then you try to reflect and think, oh, I, I did this today, I did this today. But now you go d- directly to the senses and you feel in your body, oh, I feel this tightness. I feel tense. I feel loose. I feel, I feel, I feel warm. I feel cold. I feel these muscles spasming. I feel this tension and then you can get back and then you can reflect so you kind of instead of going from instead of going from intellectual reflection of how you feel you actually feel how you feel and then you go to the re- reflection and that's what happens at the aditana because you sit with strong determination not to move and the battle starts you get to 30 minutes, it's okay because you've been, you've been meditating a lot, so it's okay. Then another fi- more 15 minutes go by, goes by and, and you kind of, it's, it's uncomfortable, but you sit in complete balance. But then the last 15 minutes, they feel like, like one minute feels like one hour. It feels like an eternity. Because your mind and your, like, all these sankaras, all these reaction patterns, they start to emerge. 
And the important thing about this part was that we had to remain completely equanimous. So we were taught that basically 100% of all the suffer suffering that we feel, it is all self-made. It's all self-made. It doesn't matter what anyone said to you. It doesn't matter what happened in your life. All the pain and suffering, like, no, sorry, all the suffering is 100% self-created. You might feel pain, but you turn it into suffering by multiplying the, the source of pain by thousands, by millions. And again, this sounds crazy, but when you experience it, it makes a lot of sense. So in the 15 minutes, my leg would start to burn. It felt like burning torture. It was burning torture. Like, I, I don't know how else to describe it. But my leg was, it felt like it was, like it was burning and, and, and someone was like poking daggers into it. Just like a big infested uh, wound and just someone just stabbing it with knives and swords. But somehow, I sat through it because we had learned a word called anicca, anicca, which is the law of nature, which says that everything is constantly changing. Everything is constantly changing. No matter what it is, it will change its form. It will change whatever it is. And so, with my leg, it was burning torture and undescribable pain. But I was just saying, Anicca, Anicca. And, and, tr and I promise, I had this equanimity because I knew it, it was going to change. I was feeling the pain in my leg. But I was not running from it. So it, I accepted that the pain was there and I didn't want to change it. That is how you remain equanimous, total balance of the mind. And it was fueled by me understanding that everything is changing all the time. And then, what happened? The, the burning torture dissolved because by feeling my body, I got to observe directly on the leg and all the signaling through the nerves, nerve ends, whatever it's called. I could feel that it was not burning torture. I had created burning torture in my mind. But I could observe that there was extreme heat. There was a pounding, like a pulsating sensation. There was pressure in a certain area of my knee. And so forth. And like I was dissecting what was happening in my leg. Instead of going... It's burning torture. It's burning torture. I want to leave. I don't. I want to. I want this to go away. So it's still true. What you hear many gurus and many uh, wise people say: Don't run from the pain. You have to enter the pain. You have to go through the pain. You have to accept reality and see things the way they are. And once I did, the burning torture dissolved. And it actually turned into something pleasant. Now that's the next part. Once you, in life, when you don't feel bad, um, and you might actually be lucky and you might feel good. That is the other part where you create like multiply suffering by the thousands and by the millions. It's because you were in pain and you ran away from pain or maybe it just dissolved, maybe you got lucky, whatever. Just, yeah. And then you move into the other territory of self-created suffering, which is desire. So you have aversion and you have desire. So you might feel amazing. And then you want that 
sensation of pleasure. You want it to stay, so you grab onto it. You want it to stay. You want this feeling. You want to feel this feeling for the rest of your life. You don't want to let it go. And what happens? It turns into suffering. And it, it actually immediately turns back into pain. And like very bad pain. So that was also what we were experiencing. I would go from this burning torture. And when I truly accepted it, it turned into pleasure. It actually dissolved. And I felt this nice heat going through the body. And I was just, oh, this is amazing. I wanted to stay, boom. When I wanted it to stay, and I, not, not that I said it out loud, or like thought it, but once I felt, I felt the attachment, it immediately turned in to, to something very bad again. And that was amazing to experience, because that is what we do in, 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 in everyday life. We try to, Stay away from the pain and we run towards the pleasure. We want to feel good all the time. So that is why Anicca is very powerful. By understanding on a deep experiential level that everything is changing all the time. Pleasure is changing all the time. Pain is changing all the time. You cannot control it. You can only leave it be and accept reality for what it is then you can be present. And that is right here in the middle, being present. Yes, you might feel amazing. You might do some amazing feats and you might has, have some nice relationships. But if you don't just enjoy those relationships, but if you all, if you are so attached to the feeling that certain people give you, then you will never actually enjoy that feeling. You just crave it. So that, that was actually the words, the words for creating suffering. It's craving and it's aversion. So you crave a feeling or you try to stay away from a certain feeling. But reality is that you will feel both at random points. That doesn't mean that you can't take action in your life and make changes. Because pain is very real, and some pain needs to be dealt with. But I think you get the point. Maybe. Okay, so what we learned is that if you could sit with these feelings, these feelings of aversion, feelings of craving, and stay in equanimity, equanimity, the sankharas of the past would arise. So once you stop creating sankharas, and we were told that you create sankharas from the day you are born because you want mother's milk or you cry or you don't want to... Uh, yeah, you know. From the day you are born, there's something you want and something that you don't want, something you want to avoid. But sitting with the pain and allowing it, accepting reality for what it is, then you are not creating sankharas. The flow stops. The production of sankharas stops. So there's no more creation of sankharas, of reacting to the senses telling you what to do. You are in full equanimity then all the old sankharas of the past, all the way to the way you were born, they will start to arise. And they can be very, very heavy. Some are very light, but some are very deep. So I, I have many more sankharas that, that I haven't gotten to. And I'm just starting to get back to reality. But I'm still going to keep meditating, of course. But... What happened for me is that I saw these Sankaras come to the surface. And sometimes I wouldn't even realize that they were all Sankaras. But not only would I feel it in my body, and it would most likely be pain, <laughs> very 
very um, excruciating pain. But I would sit with it, and it would also turn into this visual. And I would be shown all these memories from my past, a lot of childhood memories, and a lot of um, recent memories, where I had felt some sort of aversion, something that was very, yeah, bad. What I felt was bad, even though it was just pain, right? I had created Sankaras there. But I would sit with them, and I could just see these memories flood into my brain. And I would look at them, observe them with full equanimity, and then I would just pop them. I remember I had this pop, 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 like like bubbles and a needle, or like balloons, needles to a balloon. I would just pop these old Sankaras. Then I would feel the dissolving. But once I felt the dissolving of those old reaction patterns, I didn't cling on to the feeling of pleasure. I just also observed the pleasure. And the equanimity was amazing. So I could enjoy the feeling, but I didn't, you know, cling on to it. I didn't kill it by by hugging it so hard. I hope that makes sense. Some meditations were better than others. Of course, and at some meditations, I, I would create more sankaras. But you know, when you do something a lot, you get better and better and better. And I just, I had so many crazy memories come up, and everything was so crystal clear. It was like you see me right now. It, it was just so crystal clear what was going on. There was no, I, I didn't. You know, I, I didn't think, I didn't reflect at all. It just happened. The things arose from my brain because somehow I was ready. I had shown my soul, my body, my mind. I was training this part of my brain to feel on a whole another level and showing it I'm ready to process whatever comes up. But there was also something so big, so huge, that I was not able to process it and then i had to like take a step back but that's also okay because if i did not ac accept that i would take one step back sometimes that would also be aversion and then i would avoid the feeling of failure right self-created suffering again so it's about not clinging on to your successes and it's about not uh, averting your failures. It's about accepting reality for what it is. Right? I know it, yeah, it sounds easy, but it makes so much sense when you go through the pain, when you accept the pain. I think that's why Wim Hof breathing and like cold exposure is 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 on the rise and, and it's been very popular because you enter the pain and you breathe through it and when you go to the other side you stand in reality and you feel great i went into the pain and i accepted it so that's basically what we did with these meditations sitting in stillness being very agitated frustrated the the body just wanting to move but we sat there full equanimity accepting reality and it was so liberating. I felt so light. So light. And, you know, you move between 130 people. And when you sit in a meditation hall, in complete silence, you can hear a needle drop to the floor, if a needle would drop on the floor. It's so silent. Of course, someone is coughing sometimes, or like moving, adjusting. Because we were allowed to do that when, when we didn't do the Aditana settings. But it was just a magical experience. And the reason why you don't talk is because... And the reason why we, we don't do nothing at all is because you can so easily like lose focus. It's so easy.
and we don't realize how we make adjustments to the truth, telling little white lies all the time. We make some we, we make something sound better than it is, or we make ourselves seem more like a hero in a certain situation by telling how hard it was for us, how difficult it was. Small adjustments all the time, but that is action and not reality. So you could just sense in the room it was just the raw truth. It was just pure honesty. And you could see it on everyone's face. Like people was facing the truth for the first time, maybe forever. If you had a very, very challenging day, you could just see it on people's faces. Just kind of like pale and just big eyes and just... Oh, I'm going into the meditation again. You just see the fear on people's faces. Well, if someone was very happy and feeling light, you could just tell. So we were constantly battling our our individual sankharas, going into the meditation again and again and again. And it's so powerful to have so many people doing this sort of work, going like between, like in front of you behind you all the time it's just like one big motion just doing the work getting deeper going deeper going deeper beautiful experience okay um so basically we had one hour we had a one hour discourse every evening. So once we had did when 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 we had done ten hours of meditation, we, we watched this video, this this uh, recorded video of um S N Goenka, which were the he he's dead now, he died in two thousand thirteen. But he's believed to be a sort of Buddha. And he tells us about, like, every night he would like, okay, you went through this and this and this, and, and tomorrow you have to face this. And every time he was just on point. He just knew the process. Of course he did, but it was wild to experience all these bodily sensations and all these realizations and thinking, like, because we, we couldn't talk to, to, to each other. We couldn't communicate. But then in the evening he would like, a like affirm, like confirm what we had went through. And and he was just so funny, just so such a free spirit. Like he had done the work. He had done all the work, working towards enlightenment. And he just made us laugh and it was very liberating after I've done after having done so much work at night. Just to laugh. Just laugh your ass off because he could like tell us the struggles we had been going through and all our uh, aversion tactics. And it was just, it, it's just so human. Um, yeah, that, that was a really nice break. And then would you, then you would go to bed and just have the most amazing sleep because you've been doing so much work. But on day five in the evening, I had so much um, awareness of my body that I took. I could just feel it vibrating. It was not shaking; it was vibrating. And at, at, at the day five, uh, night time, when going to bed, I I was just sitting in some sort of no no. I was laying in the bed in some sort of uh, euphoric state for two hours, just vibrating, feeling so light. And I would just feel these waves of pleasure going through my body, uh, just vibrating all over. But I was also kind of scared because I didn't know how to stop this sensation. So I talked to the main teacher who had been training under Guenka the next day, and he told me just to focus on my hands and feet. And every time I did, the, the sensations would stop because I was focusing on my hands and feet. 
because that's two very grounding places. So you feel very grounded. But what I found out is that I've, I've always been vibrating. If you go into the science, everything is vibrations. And that's why maybe when you hear that, you say, oh, yeah, that's some hippie bullshit. No, it, it's actually scientifically. You know, Everything is moving all the time. That is the law of nature. Every, everything is in constant um, motion and changing. And that's just the truth. That is um, that is what the uh, Siddhartha Gautama um, discovered twenty five hundred years ago, twenty five centuries ago, and then he became fully enlightened by the age of thirty five, and then he became the Buddha. Now he wanted to give this uh, technique to everyone, but you know what happens to people? We make Everything a religion, a sect, um, where you have to do specific things to be uh, to be the like a genuine good person. That yeah, you know, we have to turn everything into a sect. But the technique is non-sectarian; it is non-religious. It doesn't have to be Buddhist. He just became the Buddha because he was from India. And then they made religions. But the technique is for everyone. Because, like Goenka said, suffering is universal. So the cure to suffering has to be universal as well. You shouldn't be required to wear a certain rope or a certain symbol in order to heal from your own self-afflicted suffering. Right? So, as he said, it, if you are a Buddhist, you can be a Buddhist. If you're a Christian, you can be a Christian. If you're a Muslim, you can be a Muslim. This will only enrich your religion by um, realizing certain aspects about yourself while you make yourself suffer. Yes. And I really like that part. And. Dhamma or Vipassana causes or this whole movement which has been going on for 2500 centuries no sorry 25 centuries it's all free you don't pay a dime it all runs on donations from old students there's not one single employee because they will not allow money to corrupt this very healing practice. It is one of the most pure things left in this world. Um, it's all created from pure love that you want to help other people. So I realized that there were old students making meals for 130 people every day, making two or three meals. For 10 days straight. They didn't take a single penny for it, uh, for it. They just wanted to help. And now of course. I also want to give back. Of course because I received this big gift. <clears throat> um, now I'm making it sound all so easy. I just want to emphasize. That. These. This ten days, it was it was the like the most difficult, the most cons like the the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. Holy. But you know, that's how it works. When you put in the work. You will be rewarded for it. Like all the time. That's why doom scrolling is so fucking stupid. You're just scrolling and typing in things that you want pleasure from. But you haven't done any work. And that's why it doesn't feel real. It doesn't it doesn't feel good. It will never satisfy your soul. 
will never satisfy your body or your mind. You have to put in the work. Um, but yeah, everything is different, but it's the same. So I've I've changed. I, I've felt it. And going back to reality, like I hadn't been stimulated for 10 days. So when I went into uh, the nearest mall, it was like like a low dose of MDMA. I think I had very big pupils. Just all the colors, all the smells and the noises. I felt like a caveman <laughs> going into civilization. But I was so calm about it. I felt so at peace because it was not overstimulating, maybe a little. But I was accepting that it was stimulating and I didn't cling on to it. Yeah, so so, what an amazing gift it is, and yeah. So I guess I I I I hope you got something from this, and um, if you're ready to do some seriously hard work, I suggest you go to one of the courses. They have centers around the world. You could go to uh, dhamma.org and check when you can join a uh, 10-day course. I'll leave some links below. Um, but, you know, it doesn't have to be this way. This is a very effective way to sort of like zoom out, look at your life, and realize some deep shit. There's so much that like I've been trying to tell a few things, but I only talk to your mind, you know. You 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 have to do the work yourself. You have to go into those places to to realize what it's actually about. And that is something I can never tell you. We each have our own individual journey, but we all have to do the work. We can't just sit on our asses, even though that's what I did for ten days. But I did something. You can't sit on your ass and do nothing and expect the returns and, and expect some sort of miraculous result. You have to do the work. You have to do something with your vibration, with your energy, with your life. Find a way. Because there are so many paths, right? What I got from this it is that life is very, very beautiful. And it's very, very just life. You know, it, it doesn't... <clears throat> I got just, just got this new appreciation and, and a lot of my Sankaras got lifted, which made me feel easier, more at ease. But I also realized that I'm very broken inside. And, and that realization has, has actually come when I got back to the real world, started observing my body, when going through different um, situations, which would, which would normally bring me down and drain my energy. But I had flipped the script, you know? <clears throat> yeah. I flipped the script. And in all those situations, I learned something very valuable. And and in the past, I would just let it kill me, you know. It was just it would just be more pain and more self inflicted suffering. But now, I'm starting to realize, that in many parts of my life, I have a very broken method of dealing with with, uh, with stuff that I didn't know before. I'm starting to realize how much suffering I've been creating for myself. But, t and yeah, 10 days won't, like, miraculously just save your entire life. But it will put you on the path to that ultimate freedom from suffering. And that is a path that I'm willing to follow. And yes, I will, f I will fall many thousand times, and I already have. When I got back 
And uh, <clears throat> that's okay. Because that's just the way things are. But I still have my direction. That is the most important thing. A sense of direction, a sense of purpose, and a sense of hope. But also accepting the the reality that, you know, we all have one birth defect, which is that we're going to die. And that is the ultimate truth that we are all running from. Even though we sometimes feel, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to die, that's cool, I'm just going to live my life. Again, that can be in the mind. But when we have when we have moments of true acceptance of death, and I don't have that right now, but I, I experience some moments, then you have full equanimity and you can enjoy your life. But it's a very hard truth. <clears throat> and we're going to die, right? But when you can accept it, you can also accept being alive. And then you can experience things and get to know yourself on a deeper level as to what do you want to try before you die. We're all going to die. I'm going to die. So what it is what what is it that I want to do? And when I know that I'm going to die, I realize how stupid it is for me to try to run from the fact that and it doesn't make sense to try to run towards pleasure and to be in the state of aversion from pain because it's all going to happen no matter what I try to do about it when I try to do something about it I will only make it worse so I need to accept it and be with reality. So you see there's a lot of layers and a lot of... We can go in so many directions. And I'm going to make more of these talks. Not talking about Vipassana. But just talking about this very important topic of how we make ourselves suffer. And how to get out of it. Which is always realizing that you can't run from it, and you shouldn't run from it. Don't cling on to pleasure, don't run from pain, just be. Yeah, I hope that helped, and if it didn't, that's just reality. <laughs> um, It's good to be back, uh, there's a lot of changes going on in my life, I guess you can imagine. Um, But I'll every time I can... Um, sit down and talk with you guys i will so i love you all and uh, see you in the next one bye